Uh, well, thank you, Pat. I uh, appreciate you and uh, Move United inviting us here. We're super excited to present to you our uh, new sit ski called Snow Yak. I also have uh, Kevin Bramble with me. Uh, Kevin has ridden Snow Yak. Uh, as most of you know, he's a two time uh, Olympic uh, gold medalist, downhill gold medalist. I also have Eric Beckman here, who's a longtime ski and snowboard instructor, and he's been with me since the beginning uh, designing it. So I imagine most of you have not uh, seen or may not have seen uh, Snow Yak or even heard of it. So before I go through uh, sort of the, the advantages of Snow Yak and what makes it special, uh, I'd like to show you a short video of Kevin riding uh, one of our proof of concept uh, prototypes. So without further, further ado, I'd like to share my screen. Hold on, bear with me a second here. Can everyone see and hear? Okay, so here we go. So that was our short video. And uh, so Sonyak, I'd like to think of it as the next generation sit ski. It's the first sit ski that I know of that puts the rider in the upright kneeling position. And uh, so the weight is centered over the center of the ski, which is, of course, skis were designed uh, for stand up skiers and the weight is centered in the middle of more or less the middle of the ski to provide uh, easy forward and back movement for weighting and unweighting of the ski. So it took us about five or so years to develop. And uh, during that time, we felt uh, the kneeling position was pretty special. So we went through the process of, of getting it patented. And we're now utility patent holders in the US, uh, the EU, as well as Japan. Uh, Soyak was made with a mod in a modular construction. So basically, we have a single base upon which uh, uh, any type of seat can be um, attached to it, as well as then uh, we have knee or shin supports. So the advantage of the, the seat beams that can be attached is uh, it's great for programs if you have uh, multiple different riders uh, using a, a single base, they can each have their own custom fitted seat and uh, this pops right off. They can have their lesson and when they're finished, pop it off and pop on the seat for the next uh, student. Uh, the this position, the kneeling position actually came, it's based on um, the ergonomic kneeling stool. Uh, maybe, maybe many of you have seen, but it's an ergonomic position and uh, it provides improved stability, performance and comfort. So we'll start at the top, uh, this upright position, uh, it puts your chest uh, high, so it makes deep breathing very easy. The, the lumbar area, it puts you in the proper spine, spinal curvature. And this is really the key here, the hips are an obtuse angle, whereas uh, traditional sit skis, they're an acute angle, and they're lean back, uh, angled back, uh, some people call it the dump position. This is a very much of an open position. And why that's important is it allows the hips to articulate uh, very easily. And so it, it opens up the hips from the, the uh, thighs. Why you want that, obviously, is uh, it makes it very easy to angulate. You get some pretty steep angles uh, with this. And then there's the shin supports, which um, really most of the weight's really on the seat. These are just, uh, there's no weight, there's no load bearing on either the knees or the shin supports. Uh, oftentimes I get stopped on the hill, I'm like, wow, it looks fun, but 
probably hurts your knees. Not at all. It is uh, super easy on the knees. Uh, that's another advantage. And so with Snow Yak, it also can be ridden by able-bodied people as well. So one of the things I also get stopped of people look a little fearful of the seat height because it does sit 19 to 20, 21 inches up. Uh, but in spite of the high seat height, it actually has a lower, a low center of gravity or, or um, it, it's because of the, the feet sitting below the, the body directly underneath as opposed to stretched out. It brings the the lower the overall center of gravity down pretty low, so it's it's a pretty similar feeling to uh, traditional sit ski. That neutral uh, seating position really allows for uh, very slight movements back and forth uh, quickly. Uh, you don't have to move very far, and it really uh, moves the weight forward and backward, so you can adjust your your weight uh, throughout the arc of the turn. And because you have that side-to-side uh, -side articulating movement, it's it's very easy also to put that ski on edge, and uh, it allows for it really makes for quick turns and also great carving. You can see some really nice carves here. Uh, one of the first questions I get uh, from the adaptive community is, "How do you load the lift?" So what you probably couldn't see from uh, the pictures so far is there's an actually a latch mechanism here. And when you approach the, the chairlift or before you actually, when you get in load position before the, the chairlift operator flags you on, you pull the latch and it drops your feet down. And so what that does is it allows uh, the chair to scoop in underneath uh, your butt and lift you right up. And so there's two positions. It's either in ski position or load position which by the way is also the same position you use to transition into the bucket so once you're on uh, th so there's no um there's no need because of the seat height there's no need for a mechanical assist or even a human assist the, the chairlift will come right in and scoop underneath your your butt once you're on because your your knees uh your feet are below um which is how chairlifts were designed for people to sit down with their, their legs below, you can uh, put the, the footrest and the safety bar down and it easily clears your knees. And so it always it will always shut. Uh, and then getting off the lift is a very similar to traditional sit ski. You put your outriggers up, thrust them forward, and it will slide you off the lip of the chair uh, gently and uh, easily. Our evacuation system is made up of three, uh, really two straps. One is the the waist strap, which is made from um, a rappel belt used by first responders around the world. It's NFPA certified, and it has a uh, it, that's made by CMC. They're they're located here in California, and then uh, it's combined with a an Austria Alpine uh, belt, which is it has a stainless D-ring, and then it's also a two-finger release. What this does is it prevents uh, it from ever accidentally releasing. And uh, by the way, it also will never release under load. So if you're getting evacuated from the lift, this will not um, release. Basically, you use the rappel belt as your waist belt. Uh, you cinch that up, and then we have a, a, a balancing strap that is um, connected in the front and it basically keeps you from tilting too far backwards or too far forwards. And both of these are connected by a locking carabiner. So when you get into ride, you put on your waist strap, tighten your thigh strap, and then there's this balancing strap. Both of those are held together by the, uh, the carabiner and you ski with the carabiner in your lap. And if you ever need to get evacuated, uh, they lower the rope down and you attach the carabiner and off you go. Another advantage of the uh, the design, and in particular the the compartmentally design, uh, the modular design, excuse me, is that the three pieces will uh, the knee or shin guards come apart and they combine together with the base on one side of an XL uh, 
suitcase and then the bucket fits on the other. One of the reasons why it's an advantage of having that bucket, there's no long uh, footrests that, that protrude out front, front, excuse me. So this is an XL hard suitcase. And uh, I know I see a lot of times on Facebook, there's people questioning it, you know, hey, how do I move my rig through the airport and check it? And I know a lot of people just put it in a bag or some people put their outriggers in it um, and hope for the best. So there's no more hoping for the best. This is uh, pretty cool that you just put it in a suitcase and, you know, it's not going to get manhandled during transit. So uh, we designed this uh, universally. So it can be used by adaptive as well as able-bodied people. And uh, the reason... Uh, it can be used by eel body people is that uh, the ankle straps, you don't actually need them uh, strapped, your ankle strapped in. I've fallen so many times and because of the way the, the shin guard is formed and it's up underneath very close to the seat, when you fall, it, it doesn't come out. You can easily pull your ankle out or take it out, not pull it out. You should use your own leg strength to take it out. Um, but what that does is it makes it much more approachable for able-bodied people who are maybe really afraid to um, be fully strapped in. They can stop on a steep hill, take their foot out, and kick stand it. So what we're hoping by this is that uh, maybe some friends and family or even instructors will, you know, use similar equipment uh, to the adaptive to their adaptive friends or to the adaptive classes they're teaching. And ultimately, maybe we'll increase the volumes. And so what that'll do is help drive the cost down because our ultimate goal here is to provide a great riding experience to the adaptive community, but then also to get the cost down. Uh, Snowyak can be ridden by anywhere that a, uh, a traditional city can, everything from easiest to double black diamonds and uh, in the powder, Bumps, bumps are super fun, and it can also be taken off jumps. I've done some small jumps. I've personally never taken it in the park, but I know that it can go, um, and I'm sure it would be fun. So after all that, and after kind of seeing and understanding what Snow Yak is, I'd like to finish by showing you a, a video, a promotional video of me riding. So keep in mind, this is, uh, you know, the seat heights are a little different uh, as I'm able-bodied. And also there's a close-up of the able-bodied rig. Um, and, it, you know, it's a prototype, so it's not a production model at all. But uh, at least this gives you an idea and you can see how to load the lift. So that's um, pretty much all I have. I'd like to open it up to questions and also thank you everyone for your time and being here. Um, again, thank you. Dino, what's happening in your world? You've got some neat stuff uh, uh, being developed. Yeah, thanks uh, Beth. Yeah, um, yeah. as I uh, told you before, I'm based in Europe. Um, right now I'm in the Netherlands. It's one o'clock here. So if I may um, say something weird, that's because it's so late. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've made a sit snowboard and I'm gonna show you a little bit more about that. Um, I've been working on the project for quite some time. Um, and yeah, I'll just go into the presentation <clears throat> mode. Uh, let me just check. 
start from a to grab my presentation. Let's just check out. Go. Oh. Well, can you guys see what I'm doing? Yes. Oh, there we go. So Maybe. yeah, the twin rider <laughs> is all about the feeling of real snowboarding, and to make that possible for people who are in the wheelchair. Um, the idea came to me when I was teaching adaptive snowboarding in Canada years ago. Uh, I had a student, he was still able to stand on his feet, but only for one turn and then he'd be too tired. So that's how I um, realized there's a need for um, this snowboard. Um, so who can use it? Well, there's no leg function required. And People with like lower spinal injuries um, can use it quite well independently. Um, the higher up the injury is in the spine, the more assistance uh, that is needed. Uh, that said, with full assistance, you can even have like a tetraplegic, um, enjoy the sideway feel of snowboarding. Um, yeah, you can see in the, in the pictures also the the ways like you can stand face to face while you're guiding, which can be nice for the um, contact with the student as well. Um, the device itself, it's um, when I started developing, we had all these wild ideas about making it um, able to go into the steepest terrain ever. But at the same time, we wanted to get something done and get it on the market. So we decided to go for a beginner rig that is also um, meant for programs to start using it with people who never snowboarded before or who had just been injured. So the knee, um, the, the position is actually quite funny to see the snow yak uh, presentation because we have a similar position. So there's both um, the knees and the um, the derriere are um, supported and as well as the feet, uh, they are um, above the board. So also this center of gravity is nicely uh, centered above the board. And what makes this a lot different from any city is that um, on the bottom, there's a hinge and there's rubbers underneath the hinge. So you can uh, transfer uh, your center of mass towards the edge of the board. If you use a ski, just the upper body can make that um, small movement. But when you have a snowboard, it's like um, 250, 260 centimeters wide. So if you uh, use your upper body to make the weight transfer, you're going to be in an extreme position, either towards the, the back or towards the toes. And you actually want to be in a fairly neutral position while you're riding your edge. And then the handlebars that are on there, they give you the direct control over the amount of edging you want to achieve. And you can even torque the board so you can have more edging on one on the left and less edging on the right, which makes it way easier to turn. So for some uh, snowboarders, they know like in the beginner progression, they sometimes use the gas pedals. So if you want to initiate a turn, you first push on the gas of your front foot. You can do exactly the same with these handlebars. So learning to ride, um, the whole idea was to make it as much of the same feel as snowboarding. And I believe we succeeded in that quite well. Um, because people who have prior snowboard experience, they uh, need a little bit of time to get used to it. But then when it clicks, all of a sudden they can transfer quite a bit of their 
snowboard knowledge to the twin rider. So here's, for instance, um, a video of a guy, Willem. This is in the indoor slopes in Holland. And this is the second run he does. He had only been practicing for like 10, 15 minutes, but he had a lot of feel for board sports and he's a professional kite surfer now as well. Uh, and this is just after a little bit of practice. So you see he's still washing out a bit and not taking that much speed. So, um, to show a bit more this controlled side slipping, it's really a combination of applying a bit of the torque as well as leaning uh, into the turn towards the heels or towards the toes. Um, so, we ha I have another video that shows a bit more also how this goes. Uh, when you look at it from the side and what's happening within the frame when people are making turns, because on the video, it's sometimes a bit hard to see. So this falling leaf exercise. So um, yeah, that's uh, showing a bit um, how it works. Also the, the lift use, um, the system is a bit different in Europe where the ski patrol actually wants to use their own equipment and they just want you to um, show where they put it, but they don't want you to bring your own equipment because they just don't trust it. So there's quite a difference between the US and uh, Europe in that sense. Um, the other thing I've been working on is also um, showing how it works and how to teach with it. Um, and I've been to Interski um, in the last, um, last time they had it in Bulgaria. And I want to show a little video of the, one of the guys from um, the UK from Daisy, and he had a nice uh, summary of what we did there. So just back from the Dutch presentation uh, on adaptive snowboarding, Gina brought along uh, adaptive snowboard, the SIT snowboard, which is a really good piece of equipment that she's developed herself over the last few years. She's been able to utilize it in the snow domes in Holland and also has uh, somewhere in the UK riding one as well, which is fantastic to hear. There's a whole host of nations in attendance to the workshop, which is really good to see, and everyone was really inspired by uh, the workshop. She was introducing us to the SIT snowboard and how it worked, as well as uh, allowing us all to try it out, which was great fun. And 
and plenty of people assisting as well on the way down. Uh, it was a real inspiration uh, to see that presentation and it's hopefully something to also work closer with Paisley to get uh, some qualifications in the six snow water integrated into our adaptive program, which will then make it a lot easier once the certified instructors to be able to operate the, the six snow board and teach it safely, then then they can uh, get these products out to market and uh, be really good to integrate it into our uh, system in the, in the near future. Watch your space. So that's um, my story about six snow board. Um, if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to ask. Gina, we've got some questions in the chat box, and people are asking about um, about the seat height. If that's adjustable, um, no, it's like one uh, one size, but we have a large one and a small one. Okay, and that might answer the question for um, for different seat sizes that, that they look it looks um, maybe large. Do you have a child's size is what's being asked. Yeah, I, I have a comment on that because um, when you are in a sit ski, you really need a very tight bucket to control <laughs> whatever is going on in the ski. But with the sit snowboards, you actually do a lot of the fine tuning of the movements with the handlebars. And the contact with the snow is uh, much more also steered from the hands. Um, so you can actually get away with a looser bucket anyway. Okay. okay. But there are some users um, that actually like to have a tight seat anyway. So they get their own custom seat on it. Okay. Hey, Laura and Ed have some questions that are related. Um, one about how, how do you get, what's the technique to get to the lift? And then um, joining that, is it recommended to use a slow or a, top, a stop to get on the lift? Um, well, first for the second question, um, to get on the lift, it has to slow down because you have to put the board sideways. And also when you get to the top, again, when you get off, you need to make that um, 90 degree turn so it's not the most practical device yet um, we're working on a model that is uh, more for more advanced riders that's going to include uh, suspension and be more um, suitable for also the more difficult terrain but that's still in the R&D phase um, and in this um, model, we also want to have the handlebars come off. So you can actually use them as an outrigger when you want to get around on the flat bits. But considering this, is, this one is meant for beginners and you're still learning, we, I decided to make it as simple as possible. And also um, anything that can come off and has some mechanism to take it off can break and is more vulnerable so that's where that decision came from actually to make it as rugged and sturdy as possible because when you see sometimes in uh, programs things get thrown around a bit especially if they have a lot of gear and only a tiny space where they put it so i wouldn't yeah i really want the equipment not to break easily yeah, yeah. Uh, so can you change out the snowboard is, is uh, a question yeah. that Clancy has. Yeah, it's um, like the handlebars, they mount on the boards, just on the regular four by four, four by two um, grid. And on top of that, the seat comes on the handlebars. So it's compatible with um, normal off the shelf <coughs> boards. Okay. Um, and, and we saw some instructor assists in the videos. Uh, Melinda has a question uh, again on that. And she says, the instructor assists from the front or the back? Um, you can do both. Like when you're uh, instructing from the front, you grab the handlebars um, and you just do the same as your student. Um, if you guide from the back, um, I generally just grab the bucket um 
in future versions, we're gonna have maybe an extension that you have a bit higher um, grip where it's more ergonomic, but in the first model, uh, that's not there yet. Okay. Hey, Gina, we've got a few people asking about independence and one is, um, is stepping into the twin rider. It looks like people have to step into it. And then also um, another question about mobility is, is uh, can people get up from a fall independently? Um, getting into the twin rider, um, if you want to make a transfer from a wheelchair, you can actually take out the whole knee bar. So open it up and then you get in and then put the knee bar back in. Um, so you don't have to step over, but with the demonstration on Interski, everybody was able to just hop in like that, which makes it easier. Um, getting up, um, stronger people that are uh, still um, like with a strong upper body, they can get up on the toe side, but they have to throw the board around when, they're on, when they landed on the heel side. Yeah, because getting up from the heel side is with the small one, it is possible, but already quite difficult with the big one. The it's better to just throw it to the toes, basically. OK, and, and I think everybody, everybody understands that these products are are um, going through all sorts of, of development phases right now. And mm -hmm. uh, but I love the questions uh, and the reason we. Yeah, yeah invited this, uh, invited you all here was so that you can put your products out and, and folks can see what's going on and you can hear back uh, the questions that people have. So you can, can um, uh, entertain that when you're, when you're designing. So mm -hmm. uh, another question here is um, what adjustments can be made for amputees? Um, I've had some amputees use it and they just kept their leg on. And this was a guy with a um, like a upper upper leg amputation. So his um, his prosthesis was just on the um, one of the knee pads. Um, if you'd have like a double above knee amputee, you'd have to really re readjust the frame to make it a custom solution, mm -hmm. I guess. Or he would just have to wear his prosthesis. Okay, okay. Hey, um, Rob and Gina, people, people are asking, where can I get this? Can I get this product in the US? When's it available? Is it on the market yet? Uh, what do either of you have to answer to that? So right now, um so we still have to make some adjustments. Uh, Kevin and I are working together, uh, particularly to make it uh, fully adaptive. So we're hoping to get something on the market uh, for next ski season. That's the aim. Yeah, so for the productive twin rider, um, we've already sold a few in Europe, but the thing is for the USA, I'm actually looking for somebody to um, be an agent or license the product because getting uh, the whole liability insurance in place as a foreigner is actually quite difficult. And then like if you have a big market, then you can do that, but it's still like a small niche product. So I would actually be uh, very happy to talk to some of the other manufacturers, if they'd be interested to cooperate in that, in that sense. Yeah, yeah. Hey, we have a follow-up question uh, in, that same, in that same category from Ryan, who, who says, asks if you can speak to the liability and risk management um, of the snow, snow yak, Rob, and, and he asked the same question, Gina, for the twin rider, but Rob, Rob if you could speak to uh, risk management and liability. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as, I'm not sure the question as far as risk management, you mean with okay, regards safety, to- Safety considerations for the equipment. Okay, sure. Uh, we do have a liability policy in place. Uh, and we've also, um, I've looked closely at the Resna 
uh, statutes. And uh, right now I haven't had it tested from, you know, uh, through Resna, but I'm aware of, it, as far as I'm concerned, it meets all of the, the safety standards. Does that, okay. uh, if, let me know if that uh, answers the question or if they're looking for something different. Yeah. Okay, and Gina, um, just safety or, or risk management thoughts on, on the Twin Rider? Um, well, we are gaining some experience in what uh, users are actually doing with the product here in Europe. Um, when I look at uh, risk management, another important thing is to get uh, instructors certified. So they know what they can and cannot do with the, with the rig. And I've been a member of Resna for quite a few years now. And yeah, it's one of the steps to get into the market. But again, um, I'm still kind of fighting that um, catch 22, where you actually have to be selling, selling rigs in order to be able to afford getting all the um, all the stuff in place like I don't have like a big investor behind me or anything mm -hmm. so I'm doing a lot of it on a bit of a shoestring budget yeah and I think I think anybody who's developed products uh, can understand that for sure mm -hmm. hey uh, so a lot of the folks here on this call um, are associated with the disabled American veterans winter sports clinic and so there are questions coming through, uh, especially one from Timothy, who asks if the DAV has any, any of this equipment, do they have a snow yak or a twin rider that, that they use at any of their events? Currently, there's no snow yaks um, outside of the few that I uh, created. I would love to speak to someone from DAV and, and work to, to get some out there for sure. Okay, we can probably get you hooked up with folks there. And that would Gina? Be great. Yeah, same. There's uh, okay. There's none of them in the veterans clinic yet. Yeah. Hey, um, Trevor asks if the if the buckets are interchangeable uh, with any other skis currently on the market, Rob. So, because of the the position. Uh, they're actually the buckets are formed a little differently, whereas um, traditional sit skis have uh, a sort of an angled back. Uh, for snow yak, the back needs to be more or less straight up and down. Uh, Kevin, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but um, yeah. So um, a, a lot of the existing seats out there, um, it depends on you know. I, I think uh, an amp could probably, since they do sit a little bit flatter. And their seats are, 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 you know, a little bit lower um, backrest could maybe get away with, with um, transferring their existing seat over to the snow yak. But I think anyone that has a traditional knees up kind of sit ski, um, probably not. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of questions on um, from Leah and Clancy again about the snow yak. Um, and and body safety so uh one from leah is i may have missed this but are there any concerns around compression on the shins for someone who has paralysis hot spots uh or skin integrity issues i'd like to defer to kevin on this one um sure um you know I, i'm a i'm a very low level injury with a, quite a bit of sensation um in 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 both of my legs uh on my left leg substantially more than my right leg but when I rode it, I was pleasantly surprised at how absolutely comfortable it is. Um, there, you know, there, 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 um, having quads that that maybe be long enough um, where you can have your shins up underneath um, of of your you know rear end um, would probably be the one of the only constraints I would see. Um, other than that, um, I, I the the seat bears you know as in a sit ski bears the majority of the weight. Um, so, so they're really it, the the, knee, the the shin guards and the knee guards are are more for a place to to rest your legs. But really, there's no there's no weight. 
on them. Um, all, all the weight is is reliant on, on the seat. Okay, thanks for that, Kevin. Yeah, and Clancy asked to follow that up. Have there been any issues reported with foot drag, especially in deeper snow? The, this first model, you know, that that's that's one of the things we're working on. Um, you know, I'm six two. Um, you know, and I had big big boots on that. You know, that that um, you know, in this first model, you know, there there were there were some instances where my my toes kind of hit the snow a little bit on on a very angulated carve um that that's going to be one of the you know defining features in the production model is to um you know make a rigid toe um cover and so so that would negate any any kind of you know um de detriment to to um the foot being anywhere near the snow but no uh, in the production model there, there won't be any concern with um uh, with with foot drag that's right, because we can also uh, angle the feet uh, inwards. Uh, so I, I don't think Kevin's seen that, the prototype that I rode that was like that. But yes, the, uh, the, he's absolutely right. The production model, there's not going to be foot drag. Okay. So Robert wants to know where he can try each of these pieces of equipment. <laughs> um, Robert, where are you located? I can't see. Uh... So anyways, next year, we're hoping to get around uh, to to certainly that we're we're based in the northeast. Um, we're going to be making trips around the northeast. And um, I'm certainly would love to come to ski spec if if that's if there's a lot of people there or, or that there's enough interest in it. OK. Um, gosh, I'm scrolling through these questions, and it looks like we're getting lots of things. Uh, Robert says he's in Connecticut, so maybe you guys can can uh, figure out a meeting place. We understand that these aren't currently on the market. However, Peter still would like to know what anticipated cost might be for these devices. So we're still uh, working on that. Our target is certainly... Uh, to be less than what's out there currently um, through a variety of, of means. We, uh, Kevin has some really smart uh, production techniques as far as, um, you know, we're gonna eliminate uh, mostly most of the welds and it's gonna be a bolt together. And then also use some techniques like water jetting, which is just as solid as CNC. It's just uh, less expensive. So we are targeting a lower price, but, um, until we finalize all the, the tweaks that we have to make this spring. Um, so I'm not trying to be elusive. It's just that uh, I, I don't want to quote you something when we're not quite ready yet, but uh, we, we will have that available next fall sometime. Okay, great. Well, gang, we have Chris Witte on the line here. And um, Chris, uh, tell us yes. what you've got going on. Yeah, so Chris with Enabling Technologies, we uh, manufacture in the adaptive sports equipment world for going on 30 years. I've been manufacturing everything from the bi-unique bi-ski to the unique mono-ski to super light outriggers. Our kind of newest products out there, you know, are the dynamic bi-ski, something like this you see here, piece of equipment there, and the Monique mono-ski, and of course, Everyone around the world uses super light outriggers and I've uh, been doing that for 20 plus years. So we, uh, you know, been innovating. Um, the Dynamic Bioski and Monique model ski kind of were just uh, the next level, uh, you know, especially on the Dynamic with uh, Bioskis uh, to have a better suspension system, a better loading system, more adjustability in the feet and the legs and kind of go through some of that. But I think a lot of y'all are kind of familiar with it, piece of equipment that said, 150 plus programs around the world. Um, we got uh, the Monique monoski, what the innovation of it was to kind of bring back to the roots of monoskiing to kind of get, you know, new to the monoski world on the slopes, you know, kind of what it took over for the last 10, 15 years was a more sports, more uh, extreme monoski that was more set for racing. And we realized it was missing the market for people who want to just learn how to ride get out, be comfortable, be safe on it. 
uh, before they got to the next level. And so now they're in about 100 plus programs around the world. Um, you know, so more and more people are learning how to ski more quickly, doing it safer, not falling as hard, getting to the, then graduating to some of the other model skis out there. So um, the biggest, you know, innovation we made this year was in our seating system. Uh, we got a new uh, fiberglass seating system for all of our new models coming out in 2022. Um, it's, you know, seen right here, all black, got the adjustability. You can clamshell it. You can go four and a half. The biggest innovation on that was that we have a lockout on the back now. You can see this here, which actually this strap goes and allows it to lock four and a half. So now you can keep yourself in the right position. Um, you can adjust it. So now you know where the sweet spot is. You know, when you get off the chairlift and you don't know where you're at and where you were the last time you rode, now you can lock it in place and it'll be there the next time you get it. So that's been a really cool innovation that we're doing. Um, I could certainly go through a bi ski, you know, and, and how our dining works, you know. Um, but I don't know, Beth, if you think that would be helpful or if you're more here to answer questions. No, go ahead. Give us some okay. information. So, yes. A little bit of bi ski, you know, uh, if you're not familiar, it's got two skis on the bottom. Here. You go left to right as you shift your weight to the left, it goes to the left. As you shift your weight to right, it makes a turn. There, that's the simple nature in the ski mode. Beauty of the dynamic bi ski is how adjustable it is. You got this footrest here, you know, that is easy to move fore and aft. It can switch it out to a different size. You got these buckets here, the bucket seat. There's four different sizes going on five in another month that allows anyone from 50 pounds to 220 pounds to ride the ski. Um, this back area here, this is the rider bar that helps to drive the ski if you have a more dependent person. If you have a more independent person, you got to put this little U-loop in there, goes right up on top, gets rid of that, you know, weight in the back. And that really is helpful. Um, the Monique model ski is built on the same kind of frame. All the parts, the seat, the feet, the back, they're all adjustable and also put a removable. So you kind of use all your stuff from both, uh, both skis. Um, the innovation on the lift system is you simply push this into the load. It goes up, then that prepares you for the chairlift. And then as you go to, you get on the chairlift line, pull it back. And then when the chairlift pulls you away, you ski right away. And then when you come off the chairlift, the weight of your body pushes it down, locks you in place, and see it off your ski. Uh, the Monique here, I don't have one in place right now because it's in the, they're all in the, all shipped uh, for this month. But um, uh, similar operation, easy to use, just with the one ski on the bottom and without the mechanism. So those are some things about the sit ski. Um, super light outriggers, obviously. Those are, you know, known the um, this here is a titanium version that's custom um that's super nice for more advanced skiers uh lighter stronger uh less less moving parts less breakage so um yeah all of our products we found on enablingtech.com uh we've really updated our manuals our like how to use them what things to look out for that's really helpful so if you haven't been there a while check it out um and we're always open to any questions. And there's a lot of programs around the world that you can test it out at. We can direct you to one if you're not familiar with it. So thank you. And I'm here to answer any questions. All right. Hey, Chris, Clancy asked if, if uh, Enabling Tech is going to be putting out any sort of adapter uh, to be able to switch out older uh, dynamic seats with the newer ones. Yeah, of course, Clancy. I, I know you, I saw Chris Gilbert the other day, you know, and. Uh, we absolutely will come up with something. We'll make sure that you'll be able to use those old seats and uh, won't have to buy a new one. So no problem. Okay. Um, can multiple seats be purchased for one Monique? Absolutely. That's a great opportunity, especially for a program and smaller programs. Uh, you can, again, put someone from 50 pounds up to 220 pounds 
in the same mono ski or bike ski, uh, just by getting a different seat, a different footrest, the frame is adjustable. Okay. Um, I'm rolling through these questions here, Chris, and yeah. they're coming in pretty, um, pretty quickly. Uh, there's one, uh, Jennifer is asking if there are any modifications for individuals without grip slash hands for outriggers. Yeah, so obviously our super light outrigger uses a string, which is the inhibiting to someone who doesn't have as much function on their hands. Um, there are individuals who use like the active hands you can find on Amazon for about $80. You can attach, help attach your hand to the outrigger. For our outriggers, a lot of people who don't have as much hand function, they'll use the flip ski in the down position. And you kind of use the edge of the ski tip to push yourself forward. Um, so that's a popular use of that because then you get the added benefit of the flip ski being able to undulate on different terrain, which is the nice thing about the super light outrigger. Um, but obviously uh, there's another company out there, Tessier, who makes a static outrigger bottom. Um, so if you do, uh, you know, want a static bottom, they offer a product, uh, you know, I can't remember what they call, but go on their website and, and that is a good option for some individuals. So. Okay. And that might answer Kevin's question because he was just asking about, um, any thoughts about manufacturers uh, putting out outriggers like the old HOC um, the, the, and they're no longer in business so they aren't right. putting that outrigger out? Yeah, so that Tessier makes the same thing. They're, I mean, effectively, you know, they, have, they both uh, came up with a similar idea. So I would highly recommend checking that out. It's, you know, available. Okay, good. What other kind of questions do you all have for, for any of our presenters this evening? Any other questions? Okay, there's a couple of things in the chat box about folks can't wait till till they get new equipment that they've ordered from from ET and and uh, sounds like people are doing some good stuff out there. Of course, um, the link to Snow Yak, I think that's www.snowyak.com, and um, so that is where you can learn more about Snow Yak. And then uh, Karen asked about, what about transport system through the airport, Chris? How are you transporting yeah, those? Papers? I don't offer a specific product. We have the Biski wheels for the Biski, for this Bionique and the Dynamique. They attach right to the back of the ski. It's a nice way to get around in the airport as such. You know, most people tend to use obviously the, you know, the wheel dollies that are already at most airports, um, you know, but, Mono skis, certainly most people are innovating their own little skateboard attachment or something along those lines, you know, so that I know that a couple of uh, companies have tried to bring a product to market and demand was just not there. Um, certainly, if you're interested, reach out. We'll see what we can come up with for you. Awesome. Hey, um, Gina and Rob, Elizabeth wants to know what, what we can do to help you get your products out sooner. I know speaking for me, uh, certainly uh, go to go to our website uh, and send me an email. Let me know you're interested and, you know, I'll respond right away. Uh, certainly we're looking to get on the road by next season and and want to get it out there as well. So I appreciate that. So definitely get in touch. All right. Dina, how can people help you get your product out there? Gina, I think we lost your audio. We lost your audio. Ah, uh, it was on mute. <laughs> we gotcha. We gotcha. Yeah. So, yeah, same thing. Um, if you're interested, let me know. Um, I'm getting uh, back on speed now with a uh, new production. Um, like everything was um, a little bit uh, quiet during the COVID times. There was not that much going on, but um, also uh, my production partners are finally back up and running. And um, yeah, my website is productive.nl. 
Um, if you send an email to the info or just to me personally, Gina van der Werf at productive.nl, you'll definitely get, um, I'll definitely respond to that. And also, yeah, I'm hoping uh, I can get things arranged for uh, next time in Breckenridge in the ski spec that I can actually come and join. Because this year I had, unfortunately, uh, the COVID hit me right a week before I could come. So that was very unfortunate. So I'm hoping to get that done. <laughs> yeah, it's so important, gang, that, that we um, who are in the field are giving feedback to these innovators and letting them know about their products, what works, what, what maybe could be um, changed a little bit. And, um, and, and they're doing it for us, aren't they? They're doing it for us. It just helps us to meet guest needs and, uh, and keep rolling into the future. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we're at our, our end time gang. So I thank everyone for being here. We had 75 people on this, on this Zoom tonight. It was wonderful to spend time and learning about Rob Thompson, Snow Yak, and Gina Vanderwerf with the, the Twin Rider, and Chris Whitty with all the stuff that you got coming out from Outriggers to uh, Sitski Innovations. And we appreciate you so, so much. Hey, this series continues. Uh, so look in your email box to learn about more information about the next three sessions coming up. We're on Thursday nights and we'd love to have you back each night. Okay, we're gonna sign off now. Thanks to everybody so much for, for participating tonight. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks guys. <laughs>